Now, today we reported on the World Socialist website the comments of the White House's coronavirus response coordinator, who said that in the best case scenario, 100,000 to 200,000 people will die in the United States from COVID-19. In the worst case scenario, 2.2 million people will die. Now, 100,000 to 200,000 dead is more than the combined American deaths in the imperialist wars of the past 75 years. That is the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Persian Gulf War, as well as the ongoing conflicts in both Iraq and Afghanistan. It is also more than the official death toll of World War I at 116,500 and could very quickly approach the US death toll in World War II of 405,000. Indeed, society once again confronts a colossal breakdown of the capitalist system, just as it did in 1914. That breakdown not only produced World War I and all of its horrors, but the solution to those horrors in the form of the October Revolution in 1917 in Russia. Now to speak on these questions tonight and take your questions is Nick Beams, who is a almost daily contributor to the World Socialist website, writing on a range of topics, including political economy, history, and numerous others and has played a leading role in the world Trotskyist movement now for almost 50 years. So I'll hand over to Nick to give tonight's presentation. Well, as Zach has outlined, the events of the past week, I think, have underscored the central point made in the opening talk of this series, that the coronavirus pandemic has raised a necessity for the complete reorganisation of society on socialist foundations. One need look no further than the US, the centre of world capitalism, for confirmation of this. The response of the Trump administration to the crisis, supported by the Democrats, including the fake socialist Bernie Sanders, has been to provide hundreds of billions of dollars for corporations, as the Federal Reserve Board, the central bank, pumps trillions into financial markets. Little or nothing has been allocated to tackle the health care crisis or to provide real support for millions of workers laid off, a pattern repeated in every country. And now the political and ideological representatives of finance capital are demanding a return to work, no matter what danger this poses to workers, so that the process of surplus value extraction can be resumed and value pumped into the mountains of fictitious capital that have been created. The great problems confronting mankind expressed so acutely in the pandemic have gone far beyond the immediate issue of the health crisis. Or, to put it another way, the health crisis has raised the most fundamental issue confronting humankind how to organize economic, social, and political relations to deal with the problems arising from the complexities of global society. The health crisis cannot be resolved at an individual level, at a city level, at a regional level, or even a national level. It requires the planned mobilization of the resources of society on an international scale. Likewise, the economic problems arising from the pandemic and measures taken to try to deal with it cannot be resolved at the national level, however many billions of dollars are shoveled out by national governments and central banks as they try to pop up their own national economies, corporations and financial systems. At the political level, it is also becoming increasingly clear that measures being put in place by national governments around the world, necessary as they may be from the standpoint of trying to control the virus spread, raise the ever greater danger of the emergence of an authoritarian and police state in order to force a back to work and to suppress the social and class struggles now emerging. Therefore, genuine democracy, 
that is the day-to-day -day control of society by the mass of the population going far beyond mere voting once every so often in elections has become imperative. Capitalism's incapacity to deal with the issues flowing from the pandemic arises from its very structure. Therefore, this and all the other crises that are certain to arise in the future cannot be resolved by replacing one set of capitalist politicians with another. A global crisis requires global solutions. But such an approach is impossible under capitalism. This is because the basis of its rule is the division of the world into rival and conflicting nation states and imperialist powers, each one of which fights to defend its own national interests. We have seen this on climate change, now we see it in this crisis. This destructive nationalist agenda is most graphically expressed in the person of US President Trump. But he is only the, you could say, the foremost maniacal representative of the ruling class and governments around the world. Nor can the ruling classes permit the democratic involvement of the mass of the world's people in taking action to develop solutions to this crisis because that would inevitably start to challenge the control of the state apparatus by the present ruling oligarchy. Today is not the first time in the course of human history that the complete reorganization of society has arisen as an existential problem, a life and death issue. In fact, this has been the great issue of our epoch, which announced its arrival with truly explosive force on August the 4th, 1914, the outbreak of World War I. Over the next four years, all the resources of capitalist society were mobilized in a struggle of each against all, resulting in the mass slaughter of millions of people and the destruction of the means of economic life, all in the interests of profit. World War I opened a new epoch in world history from which there could be no turning back, as can be seen by what followed. The ending of the war did not bring a return to the so-called Belle Epoque of the pre-war period, the culmination of capitalism's advances in the 19th century. Rather, it led directly to still more horrors mass unemployment and poverty in the Great Depression of the 1930s, the rise of fascism in Germany, Italy and other countries, the intensification of conflicts between the great powers leading to another world war, culminating in the use of atomic weapons and mass murder on an industrial scale in the Holocaust. For a brief period of time, brief when measured on the scale of historical processes, it appeared that these monstrosities had, so to speak, been put in history's strong box, locked down, never to return, as capitalism expanded in the period after World War II. But none of the contradictions that have produced the catastrophes of the first decades of the 20th century was resolved. And so they have broken the locks and erupted once again. The coronavirus is only the most immediate and one could say accidental expression of this process. But it is an accident that expresses necessity. Here, there is a direct parallel with the outbreak of World War I in 1914. The trigger for that crisis was the assassination of the Austrian Archduke Ferdinand on June 28, 1914. It was very much an accident, but this accident played a key role because it was like a lighted match being thrown into a pile of already accumulated combustible material. All the tensions and conflicts 
that have been building up over the preceding period between the capitalist great powers exploded in war. It arose directly out of one of the fundamental contradictions of capitalist society, that between the development of a global economy and the division of the world into rival nation states. Each of the great powers sought to resolve this contradiction by establishing itself as the dominant world power, setting off a war of each against all. There is another parallel. In the war, millions of workers were dragooned onto the battlefields by the capitalist class to die for profits, markets, and resources. In the coronavirus crisis, capitalist politicians the world over, taking their cue from the fascistic maniac in the White House, are demanding that the economy, by which they mean profit, must not be sacrificed to health considerations. If certain sections of the population have to die in order to keep the money machine turning over, then so be it. World War I signified the end of capitalism's progressive role in the historical development of mankind. But out of the smoke and fire, the blood, carnage and havoc, the solution arose. Setting out that solution in 1915, Leon Trotsky wrote, war is the method by which capitalism, at the climax of its development, seeks to solve its insoluble contradictions. To this method, the proletariat, that is the working class, must oppose its own method, the method of social revolution. The socialist reorganization of the world economy had to be fought for, not as some kind of distant goal lodged in the mists of the future, but Trotsky continued as a practical program of the day. The fight for world socialist revolution was the perspective for which Lenin, Trotsky, and the Bolshevik party fought as they led the Russian working class to the first successful overturn of capitalism in the revolution of October 1917. Now, it was never conceived of as simply a Russian issue, but as the opening shot of world socialist revolution. A series of conditions meant that the possibility of the working class taking power had arisen first, not in an advanced capitalist country, as had previously been expected, but in a backward country, Russia. Whatever the difficulties this presented, the opportunity had to be grasped, Lenin insisted. It was necessary to point the way out of the barbarism into which capitalism had plunged humanity. If that task were renounced, he said, it would constitute a monstrous betrayal even greater than that carried out by the Social Democratic and Labour parties when they had lined up behind their own ruling classes and voted for war expenditure in 1914. Now, I think it's safe to say that there is no historical event which has been the subject of more lies than the Russian Revolution. The biggest lie of all propagated for more than a hundred years by the ruling classes and their mouthpieces is that the Russian Revolution was a coup. It was carried out by an evil and scheming genius, Vladimir Lenin, who was somehow able to exploit the crisis in Russia produced by the war to carry out his plan for a dictatorship. Facts, dominated by scripted, documented, by scrupulous historians refute this lie. In his preface to the history of the Russian Revolution, Trotsky wrote, the most indubitable feature of a revolution is the direct interference of the masses in historic events. In ordinary times, he continued, political affairs are conducted by specialists elevated above society, ministers, parliamentarians, influential journalists, and the like. 
But when the old order breaks down and becomes unendurable, then we have the forcible entry of the masses into the realm of rulership over their own destiny. Now, if you consider the present situation, confronting the masses the world over, you will, I think, begin to appreciate what the Russian Revolution was really all about and why millions decided it was necessary to storm the heavens and sweep away the old order. In World War I, countless lives were sacrificed in a daily, never-ending slaughter in the interest of profit. In the present crisis, the lives of working people are being sacrificed on the altar of corporate and financial profit because the present social system refuses to deal in any meaningful way with the threat posed by this disease. The Russian Revolution established for all time two fundamental truths. First, it demonstrated not just in theory, but in living events, that the working class created by capitalism is capable of overthrowing it and is compelled by the force of events to undertake this task. Second, it established the necessity for the construction of a revolutionary party armed with a clear and scientifically derived program and perspective to lead the masses to victory. The elemental force of the masses, their direct intervention in the historic process, is of course the driving force of the revolution, not the evil conspiracies of revolutionists, as the bourgeois fiction would have it. But as Trotsky once explained, just as the generation of steam needs a piston box to drive the locomotive, otherwise its potential power is dissipated into thin air, so a revolutionary party is needed to harness the elemental force of the masses to drive the locomotive of history. That analysis was confirmed positively in the Russian Revolution. It has been proved in the negative since then. There have been a series of revolutionary struggles over the past 100 years, but none of them has led to victory. This is not because capitalism and its state forces have been too powerful, but because the masses have not had at their head a revolutionary party of the Bolshevik type. The Russian Revolution did not just overthrow the old capitalist order. It started to lay the foundations for a higher one, ending capitalist ownership of the means of production and establishing socialized, nationalized production organized by a new state. Despite all the crimes, mismanagement and sabotage of the Stalinist bureaucracy, these new social and economic relations demonstrated their enormous power. Nationalized property relations ensure that the Soviet Union, starting from a backward and impoverished economy, was able to create the necessary means to defeat the armies of Nazi Germany in World War II. And just 12 years after the conclusion of that war, which had led to the deaths of 25 million of the Soviet Union's people and untold damage to its economy, it was able to launch the first mission into outer space. Now think about it. With the enormous advances in the productive forces over the past decades, resulting from the combined labour of billions of working people the world over, one can only imagine what great heights would be achieved if socialised property relations were established in the advanced countries and all over the world. The question now arises, why did the first worker state degenerate, giving rise to a monstrous bureaucracy under the leadership of Joseph Stalin? The answer to this question is by its nature complex and it was analyzed in all of that complexity by Trotsky in his masterwork, 
revolutionary trade. Here, I can only point to the most essential causes of the de degeneration. The fundamental point is that it did not arise from the theories of Marx or Lenin. To advance such a position is to adopt a completely unscientific approach in which history is seen as the outcome of the intentions, good or bad, of theorists and political leaders. Now, the source of great historical shifts and changes is not to be found there, but in the material conditions in which society develops. The Russian Revolution was fought for by the Bolshevik Party not as a project to build socialism in isolated Russia, but as the opening shot of world socialist revolution. Lenin believed it would not even be possible to maintain power in Russia unless the revolution extended to the more advanced countries of Europe. That did not take place, due initially to the betrayals of the Social Democratic and Labour parties that stood at the head of the working class. Having supported their own bourgeoisie in the war, they worked might and main, including by murdering revolutionists to keep the bourgeoisie in power in the face of the revolutionary struggles that had started in the war and then massively extended in its aftermath. Europe was aflame, but the working class did not have a leadership of the type that had existed in Russia. It was headed by parties that either equivocated or vacillated in the face of the revolutionary storms or were outright counter-revolutionary. Despite the intervention of 14 imperialist armies, the new workers' state was able to hold on, but an entirely new situation had been created, a workers' state in a sea of capitalist encirclement. Now that posed great problems because economic conditions handed down from the past could not be changed overnight through the issuing of a decree. In conditions of isolation, the economic backwardness of Russia took its toll. Because of economic deprivation and scarcity, even as the economy revived somewhat, after the imperialist intervention had been defeated, a bureaucratic apparatus began to emerge. It determined who got what and how the scarce resources of society were allocated. Was this some inevitable outcome of the revolution or the policies of the Bolsheviks? All the organs and mouthpieces of the bourgeoisie, to, bourgeoisie maintain it was as they seek to prevent the working class from again taking the road of revolution. But the emergence of a bureaucratic apparatus had its origins in the betrayals of the revolutionary upsurge in Europe by the social, social democratic parties. Had these revolutionary struggles culminated in the conquest of power, they would have transformed conditions in Russia. Far from arising, from the doctrines of Marxism, the emerging bureaucratic caste under the leadership of Stalin explicitly repudiated them. In opposition to the perspective of world socialist revolution, it brought forward the nationalist reactionary dogma of socialism in a single country. And this program had an inherent objective logic. Socialism in one country meant the repudiation of socialist revolution elsewhere. What then of the program of Marxism? Was it somehow responsible? No, it separated itself from the bureaucracy beginning in 1923 with the formation of the left opposition under the leadership of Trotsky to fight the emerging caste and its disastrous policies. Notwithstanding the enormous problems confronting the fledgling workers' state, the left opposition advanced a program to meet them. It rested on two foundations, the return to the internationalist program on which the revolution had been based and the direct involvement of the working class in developing solutions to the great economic and social problems it now confronted. 
But why, you might well ask, was this program defeated? Why did Stalin triumph? Many have stumbled over these questions. And the reason is that the issues are wrongly conceived, as if political struggles were a matter of logic or a kind of chess match. A political struggle, however, is in essence a conflict of opposed social forces. The program of the left opposition was based on the working class. But the working class in Russia was exhausted, having expended enormous energy in a decade of struggle, the war, revolution, and the three-year war against imperialist intervention that followed. Its revival depended on an international upsurge, but here there were only setbacks and defeats. It was this material situation, not some failings of Marxism, that led to the triumph of the bureaucratic caste. And those defeats continued, above all in Germany, where the disastrous policies emanating from Moscow and followed by the German Communist Party led to the greatest defeat of all, the coming to power of Hitler and his Nazi regime in 1933. Drawing up a balance sheet of these experiences, Trotsky advanced the necessary conclusion. The perspective of world socialist revolution could only be taken forward by the founding of a new international, the Fourth International, and that was established in 1938. Far from Stalinism arising from Marxism, it was its antithesis, carrying out the mass murder of Marxists in the Soviet Union and the assassination of Leon Trotsky in August 1940. In conclusion, let us draw up a balance sheet. One of the great bourgeois myths is that the revolution diverted Russian society from a so-called normal course of development that, had it been allowed to continue, would have brought a flowering of democracy. But the issue in 1917 was not bourgeois democracy or socialist revolution, but socialist revolution or military, counter-revolution and dictatorship. Had the working class not taken power, fascism would be a Russian word, not an Italian one. And the Holocaust against the Jews would have been initiated not in Germany, but in Russia. And when the Stalinist bureaucracy carried out the culmination of its betrayal of the revolution, liquidating the Soviet Union and its nationalized property relations in 1991, we saw not the emergence of democracy, but the dictatorship of Vladimir Putin. Around the world, the bourgeoisie hailed the dissolution of the USSR as the definitive repudiation of socialism, the death of Marxism, and even the end of history itself. With these threats having been expunged, the bourgeoisie was now going to bring a new order of peace and prosperity based on the capitalist free market and liberal democracy. Well, we know how that's all turned out. The last three decades have seen endless wars and the threat of a new world war, social deprivation, ever greater social inequality, existential threats from climate change, and now the sacrifice of potentially millions in the interest of profit, as we see in the coronavirus crisis. And what of democracy? Well, its fate is nowhere more clearly revealed than in the incarceration, incarceration of Julian Assange in London's Belmarsh Maximum Security Jail for publishing the truth about the war crimes of US imperialism. So what is to be done? The answer is staring us in the face. Resume the fight for world socialist revolution begun in 1917, but unable to be completed. So I make a call to all of you listening tonight. If you want to fight for the future, then join our party. Apply now 
today. There's no time to lose. We will train and educate you in the fight to build the Revolutionary Party, to lead the working class, to overthrow capitalism and create a new world fit for human beings to live in. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank Nick for that really very informative and uh, comprehensive lecture, which went through, as I'm sure you all agree, a number of really seminal, major um, historical and political issues dealing with the history of the Russian Revolution and its perspective and relevance for today. I just want to take this opportunity to note that we have participants that are taking part from all throughout Australia, uh, in Sydney, Brisbane, the Blue Mountains, Newcastle, Melbourne, uh, and Adelaide, but also internationally uh, from New Zealand, from Sheffield, and from Germany in, in Berlin. Uh, so this is a international meeting uh, that we are currently taking part in. Um, I just wanted to also take this opportunity to reiterate the point that Nick made and encourage everyone who is not yet a contact of the IYSSC and SEP to become one today. Um, we want to know your story, to know what is taking place in your office, in your school, your university, construction sites. The voice of the working class must be heard, and we are ready you know, to tell your story. Now, if you have not already done so and considered, you can go into the chat field and in there enter your message questions that you have about this lecture, about the previous lecture on the coronavirus, um, and any other aspects relating to the fight for socialism. Um, as you know, Nick went through, these are complex issues, but they have at their heart all the political questions that we confront today. So feel free to raise whatever question you have on any number of, of these issues, even if you think that it is an obvious question or one that no one else will have. Whenever there's a question, it means that there's someone else who has it. Um, and since this is an international meeting, probably won't just be someone who's taking part in Australia. Um, now we do have one question that has come through that deals with some of these issues. Uh, Margarita asks, it seems like the reason that Marxism didn't take a foothold internationally, possibly because countries around the world saw how communism developed. Why should countries be ready to take this gamble when the consequences are so high? So that question relating specifically to the question of communism um, and the USSR. So I think maybe we'll take that question and then others. So Nick, would you like to have well, a go at well, that? Yeah, the first point I'd make, um, and this is of course one of the great myths promoted by the bourgeoisie, what developed in the Soviet Union in the aftermath of the revolution from mid 1920s onwards, was not communism, it was Stalinism. It was the rule of a bureaucratic caste, which emerged, as I sought to explain, not out of the doctrines of Marxism, but out of the material conditions in which the revolution found itself. As I emphasized, had there been a revolution in Italy, in France, and above all in Germany, the most powerful industrial country in Europe at the, at the time and today, then conditions in Russia would have been vastly different. The working class would have gone forward. It would have gone forward in collaboration with the workers of Germany, of Britain, of France, of Italy, and not insignificantly, the United States where revolutionary conflicts were developing to construct a genuine socialist economy. That is an economy in which the working class had control of the state and was able to direct uh, the resources of society to meet human need. Now, that didn't take place and it did not 
take place, not because of any lack of striving by the working class to take the road of October 1917. I mean, just in Italy, for example, 1919, 1920, there were a series of major struggles, factory occupations. But the problem was that the working class in Italy did not have a leadership which could take it to power. It did not have the type of party created by Lenin and headed by himself and Trotsky. In Germany, the working class again and again, from the period of 1918, 1919, the struggle that brought down the Kaiser, entered the road of revolutionary battles in 1920, 21, and above all, 1923, when a revolutionary situation clearly emerged. But at that stage, the German KPD, the Communist Party, vacillated and the revolutionary opportunity was lost. And that helped create the conditions for the uh, emergence 10 years later of uh, Adolf Hitler and his Nazi regime, aided and abetted at this point by the disastrous policies pursued by the KPD when it refused to form united front organizations of the working class to fight and defeat the fascist menace. So there's no question, as your question implies, that the uh, development of this bureaucracy constituted, you could say, a great turnoff for workers around the world. Yes, they were in the 1930s uh, very uh, impressed by the developments of the economy in the Soviet Union, but they were repelled, large sections of them, by the actions of the Stalinist regime. And uh, that enabled the existing parties to uh, the Social Democrats, the Labour parties, who completely supported the bourgeoisie to remain in the saddle. Now, you speak about a gamble. Um, the, the issue is the following, I think. Revolutions are an extremely complex process. The overthrow of the old order, the capitalist order, which has ruled for centuries, is it the most difficult task posed before humanity in its history. However, while you speak of a gamble, we can say, to use the odds of a bookma bookmakers, it's a hundred to one on that capitalism is going to plunge mankind into further disasters in the coming period. The coronavirus is only the first of such catastrophes. It has been the conditions now created. Why, why is the health system in such disarray in every country that it cannot deal with this epidemic? Because over the last 40 years, all the resources of society have been utilized to boosting the financial wealth of the corporate and money elites at the expense of society. This uh, fictitious capital has had value pumped into it by the destruction of social services, healthcare, education, privatization, and so on. All the gains of the past, as we have some uh, listeners from Britain of the national health system established after World War II as a concession to the working class have been gutted and destroyed. In this country, the same thing. In America, the health system is completely chaotic, dominated by the interests of big pharmaceutical companies, insurance companies, and so on, for which health is a source of profit. Now, we are speaking about certainties. This catastrophe is just one of them. The first, a new world war is in the offing. Preparations are being made by the imperialist powers for new wars. That's why Trump consistently speaks of the Wuhan virus, the Chinese virus, as if it has a passport or a nationality. Why does he do that? Because the central policy, foreign policy of the United States 
and its ruling elites is the destruction of China, whose rise it sees as a potential threat to its global hegemony. That's the future we are facing. Now, if you want to, uh, you know, if, if your proposal is to back capitalism, then you are really backing or you are really taking the road of social disaster and a plunge into barbarism. You see, the choice in Russia, as I emphasized, was not between some kind of continuing or some kind of bourgeois democracy that might develop. It was between socialist revolution or the absolute certainty of capitalist military dictatorship. The same issue arises before the working class in every capitalist country today. It's the choice between the road of socialism, the fight for socialist revolution, or the certainty of a descent into capitalist barbarism. Now, of course, there are confusions, there are questions about what happened in the Soviet Union. That's why we insist that the political education of the working class on these fundamental issues is absolutely necessary. And uh, we make the pledge, as I raised in my uh, initial remarks, if you want to fight, join our party and we will provide you with the theoretical, political, intellectual weapons with which to answer these questions and reorient the working class on the new road that it must now take. And just to emphasize that, in order to get involved uh, and apply to join uh, or to to get involved in the work of the Socialist Equality Party uh, and its sections, the link is on the screen at the moment, scp.org.au slash website slash about slash get dash involved. We have a number of other questions that have come in. Um, one of them that asks uh, from a participant, uh, Cobra asks, how close are we to the possibility of a global uprising of the working class against capitalism and the current political system? That's a that's a very important uh, a very important question. Over the we could say starting really from the late eighties, uh, we have seen. A, around the world, a suppression of the class struggle. Strike levels, for example, which are a measure of uh, class activity by the working class, are there are the lowest levels and have been at their lowest levels virtually in history, in country after country. That suppression is the outcome of the role of the trade unions and the labour bureaucracies which have enforced the dictates of the capitalist ruling class. But over the last two years in particular, we have seen the situation change very dramatically. We've seen an upsurge of workers in a number of countries, so-called underdeveloped countries and advanced capitalist countries alike. We've seen mass demonstrations involving hundreds of thousands of workers in India, in the Middle East, in Chile, for example, just last year, the uh, head of the uh, one of the heads of the government in Chile gave an interview to the Financial Times last year, in which he explained that there may be upheavals in the rest of Latin America, but Chile was the most stable country on the continent. Just about a week later, thousands, tens of thousands, indeed hundreds of thousands, were demonstrating in the streets against, I think it was a 30 uh, something rise in metro fares. And one of their slogans was, it's not 30 pesos, it's 30 years. 30 years of declining wages, the gutting of social services, attacks on democratic rights. 
And we've seen the emergence once again, only initially, of that great sleeping giant, the American working class. It's now rousing itself. We saw last year the very important auto workers strike in which our party directly participated. We've seen the mass struggles of teachers in state after state across the US. And in every country, there is a ferment, there is a hostility. The old regimes are seen as corrupt, as incompetent. The whole system is seen as rigged. Millions of youth the world over strive to get an education, place themselves in debt involving you know tens and sometimes even hundreds of thousands of dollars only on occasions to work up ending at McDonald's. We've seen an enormous opposition and where they do get jobs, it's in the so-called gig economy where they have no social rights, no job security and so on. The bourgeoisie has been a warning of such a developments, uh, the emergence of revolutionary struggles around the world. The crucial question is the provision of leadership of these struggles. You see, the Revolutionary Party doesn't create the mass movement. It doesn't matter how much you know we agitate in that sense. The mass movement develops when the old order becomes intolerable, when all the old verities are seen to break down, as we see now. Within just a few weeks, it has been demonstrated to millions of people that capitalism cannot maintain even their most basic standards of life. That is producing growing struggles in the United States. We see today, we wrote a perspective on the World Socialist website today of a series of strikes by workers. We saw the auto plant shutdowns partially a few days ago. Now we see workers striking at Amazon, at Instacart and other places. We find enormous opposition among healthcare workers to the conditions under which they're being forced to work. Mass struggles have already developed over the past period and will develop at an enormous pace in the future. Why is that? For one very simple reason. The trillions of dollars that have been pumped into the financial system do not represent real value. The source of all value, they are a claim on value, not value itself. These vast financial assets represent a claim on the value of the resources produced by the working class. So in order to, after pumping up the financial system to an historically unprecedented degree, the bourgeoisie must demand that value be put into these financial claims. So however this coronavirus crisis develops and uh, however it passes, the debts will remain. The inflation of financial assets will remain. The debts will be paid, the bourgeoisie will demand, and where will the value come from? Out of the working class. And uh, that will involve enormous social struggles in every country, because every country is affected by the same processes. And that will give rise to the development of revolutionary struggles. The crucial question is whether there is a leadership that has been prepared, trained, and educated in advance with a scientifically derived program to lead those struggles to victory. The growth of such a mass movement will not of itself resolve those problems. Only when it is guided by a revolutionary party, which has to be built now. That's why we're urging you to join our movement. There are a number of questions, which is excellent, that are coming in on a range of topics, and we will try to cover them as best we can. Uh, one questioner, uh, Kayla, asks, 
What are your thoughts on the recent loss of Jeremy Corbyn and the UK Labour Party, as well as the likely loss of Bernie Sanders in the US presidential democratic primaries? Uh, what are your thoughts in general of trying to promote democratic socialist policies within major establishment parties? Now, just while Nick uh, mulls over the question, I just wanted to again take this uh, opportunity to remind everyone uh, if you have not already made a donation, please do so. Uh, this is in order to assist us in holding more meetings just such as these where we can take questions and, and discussion. Um, just a reminder though, if you are not an Australian resident, please make your donation to the World Socialist website. Uh, the links are in the chat and are also displayed on the screen above you. Uh, all right, so Nick, um, do you want to take that question? This, yeah. This question on Sanders and, and Jeremy Corbyn and the more general issue is very important, is a very, very important one. Because what we have to uh, develop above all is the political independence of the working class. That is independent from the bourgeoisie. I'm gonna make the point in next week's uh, lecture and discussion, but I can preview it here. The working class cannot overthrow the bourgeoisie, the most complex and difficult task in history, if it is ideologically and politically subordinated to it. Now, let's take the issue of Corbyn. The rise in his popularity, the rise in, in uh, his uh, rising to the position of the leadership of the Labour Party, arose out of the enormous disgust, hatred and opposition in large sections of the British working class and youth to what had gone before under Blair and Gordon Brown. Blair, who was the, you could say one of the, along with Bush, but even more so Blair in many ways, the architect of the imperialist intervention in the Iraq war of 2003, who was even uh, greater in his capacity of producing lies uh, than, than Bush to some extent. The dodgy dossier, we're 15 minutes from annihilation and so on and so forth. And of course it uh, also was fueled by the attacks on the working class fueled by the Blair government and then continued under the government of Gordon Brown. Now, Jeremy Corbyn came to leadership. He posed as a socialist, as uh, someone who would uh, return, reverse the austerity carried out, initiated under Thatcher, continued uh, by uh, Corbyn and Brown. But his whole leadership was characterized by a complete subservience to the Blair right wing in the Labour Party. He took no action against them. When they launched a completely bogus campaign that there was anti-Semitism rife in the British Labour Party, Corbyn did not take that struggle on, defeat uh, and oppose these attacks, completely slanderous, but rather bowed to the Blairites such that they are now back in control. He repudiated all of his so-called pacifist promises of the past to stop the Trident missiles, get out of NATO and so on. Uh, that was the issue and uh, on Brexit, for example, we advanced a program uh, for the United Socialist States of Europe. Our party took a stand of an active boycott against the Brexit re referendum. We said there was nothing to be gained by supporting either of the positions. Both of them in different ways represented different sections of the bourgeoisie uh, in Britain. And that the working class had to unify uh, in the struggle for the United Socialist States of, of Europe. But that that was the only way uh, forward. Corbyn had no such policies, no such agenda, uh, and so on. And uh, so he was, uh, uh, the defeat of him in the election uh, was in many ways a foregone conclusion. Now, there's a very important point about this. 
right from the outset, the various, and we'll be discussing this further next week, various organizations around the world, which we have characterized as the pseudo left, which parade themselves as socialist, flocked behind Corbyn. Corbyn, they maintained, represented the new way forward. We insisted that this was not possible, that you can't turn wine into water, water into wine. The British Labour Party is a long established organ of British imperialism, that the Labour Party could not be transformed under Corbyn or anybody else, that the crucial task was not to place a left leadership in the British Labour Party, which would once again impose defeats upon the working class, but to build a new revolutionary party. And the same issue arises in regard to Bernie Sanders. Again, the pseudo lefts around the world, uh, particularly the Democratic Socialists of America, have promoted uh, Sanders as a way forward for socialism a member of the oldest capitalist or a so-called independent but aligned with the democratic party the oldest capitalist party in the world the party of the slaveocracy the party of the dixiecrats the party of war world war one and world war two was now somehow through the elevation of Bernie Sanders going to be miraculously transformed into uh, a vehicle for so-called democratic uh, socialism. What Sanders' real role was the following. Under conditions of enormous hostility to the Democratic Party, particularly among younger sections of the population from which he drew most of his support, to the Democratic Party, he provided, and what his aim always was to provide a kind of safety valve to draw in these, uh, dis these dissident elements, these hostile elements, trap them behind his movement, and then bring them back behind the Democratic Party. That's exactly what he did in 2016, when despite the rigging of the uh, nomination process by the DNC, a fact revealed by WikiLeaks, uh, he uh, endorsed Hillary Clinton as the presidential candidate. And he will do exactly the same thing again. Now, the issue is the following. No, the working class cannot find it. the working class cannot find its way forward through any of these parties. It has to build its own independent revolutionary party to fight for its program uh, and perspective. And what happened to uh, Bernie Sanders? Well, of course, all the uh, organisations. Uh, that supported him, the Democratic Socialists of America, the International Socialist Organization was so keen to back Bernie Sanders that it actually liquidated itself, I think in April 2019, so that it could rush into the Democratic Socialists of America and back Bernie Sanders. All of these tendencies tell us that, well, this somehow represented the way forward. We've heard so many of these arguments before. Just recall, 2004, you had to vote for John Kerry because that was the only viable alternative to Bush. I remember back in uh, 1964, we were told we've got to vote. You've got to vote uh, for Lyndon Johnson and not the warmonger. Barry Goldwater. And what happened? I remember one uh, man from America with whom I was associated at the time said to me rather ruefully, well, in 1964, I voted for the peace candidate, Lyndon Johnson. He then unleashed the horror of the Vietnam War. 
So we've been these are we've been through these experiences. The you know position that somehow we have to choose the lesser evil, support for the Democratic Party and so on has proved utterly bankrupt over the past more than 100 years. The Democratic Party, as our movement has rightly explained, is not the vehicle through which socialism can be advanced or social struggles can be advanced. It is rather the graveyard of these struggles. And that applies to every other uh, capitalist party around the world, the Labour Party, Social Democratic Parties, and so on. The issue is the construction of a revolutionary party of the working class of the Bolshevik type. We have another question. Uh, we have a number of questions, um, but one from a participant who raises the uh, left opposition uh, established, of course, and led by, by Leon Trotsky and the old guard Bolsheviks against Stalin. Um, they note bourgeois historians and pseudo-left organizations fail to articulate the relevance and fundamental struggle the left opposition waged against Stalin and asks, are you able to elaborate a bit more on this? What, for example, is the relevance of the left opposition to the ICFI uh, and how does it carry uh, the legacy of the Russian Revolution? That is, how does our world movement, the International Committee of the Fourth International, continue the legacy of the Russian Revolution. Um, again, I'll just take this opportunity to remind our listeners of the contact form, which is in the chat field. Um, I mean, I think as has been made clear through the course of both the les les uh, lecture and this discussion, uh, the working class confronts life and death questions. But above all, what is required is a program and a perspective to carry forward uh, what will be and are developing monumental struggles um, in this period. The SEP you know, is the only political party that articulates such a perspective. So in addition to signing up, if you haven't done so already, please make a donation as generously as you can. All right, Nick, would you like to take that particular yes. question? Well, well, our origins do lie in the formation of the left opposition by Leon Trotsky in uh, 1923. You're right, the uh, bourgeois historians dismiss, in the main, the struggle of the left opposition. And they really put forward a theory that, well, Stalin won, that's it, that's all there is to be said. In other words, that there was no alternative to Stalinism, but there was. I would recommend to the questioner and to all others interested in this question that they order from Mehring Books uh, the very valuable work of Vadim Rogovin, the uh, Soviet historian, his Russian historian, uh, sociologist, with whom the International Committee worked very closely in the last years of his life, in which he published seven volumes on this history. Uh, the we have uh, published uh, just in recent translation his latest one of his works which deals meticulously with the struggle of the left opposition. I just want to make uh, just to elaborate one point that struck me very powerfully from uh, that book. You see the. The theme of bourgeois historians is that, well, Stalin's mass repression uh, carried out under the course of industrialization from 1928 onwards was really necessary. There was no other course possible. The left opposition, in fact, put forward a very clear alternative perspective. First of all, it pointed out and drew out that the crisis that confronted Russian society in 1928 was itself the product of the previous policies pursued by the bureaucracy. From 1923 onwards, the left opposition, particularly on Trotsky, was advocating that a program of industrialization had to be developed. It had to be developed in a planned and conscious manner 
um, but it had to, and the resources of the state had to be used. Unless that was done, Trotsky warned, there would be a crisis in Soviet society. Why? Because the peasant would go on producing uh, grain, but there would no, be no, not enough industrial products to, uh, for which that grain could be exchanged. And therefore, what Trotsky referred to as a scissors would open up. There will be divergence between the mass of the peasantry at that point and the industrial working class. Therefore, it was necessary to develop in a planned and conscious manner industrialization. That was rejected by the Stalinist bureaucracy. According to uh, uh, Bukharin, the policy of the NEP, the New Economic Program, which had restored uh, some of the capitalist market to the peasantry, uh, would just continue ad infinitum. As he put it, we are riding to socialism on the peasant nag. At the same time, and intimately connected with this, was the adoption of the nationalist doctrine of socialism in one country. Now, the crisis that had been predicted by the left opposition erupted in 1928. Stalin ordered a left turn. Now, was this inevitable? No. As Vadim Rogovin very meticulously documents, the left opposition had an alternative program. Yes, the risk of the kulaks, the rich peasants, had to be counted, no question about it. But how was it to be counted? Not by bureaucratic measures from above, the so-called forced collectivization, which devastated Soviet agriculture, but by committees of workers, by committees in the villages, by the involvement democratically of the working class in turning the economy around. That, of course, was completely anathema to the bureaucracy because the development of such democratic forms of organization, the mobilization of the resources of society to deal with the crisis would have undermined the basis of the bureaucratic rule of the Stalinist apparatus. So this is a very, very important question. Um, Stalinism and its policies were not, uh, you know, and it's, were not inevitable. There was an alternative. The bourgeoisie and its historians always seek to cover this up uh, because they want the working class to believe that it take, if it takes the road of socialist revolution, then something like Stalinism is inevitable. You can see the class interests that are served uh, by this type of theory. We have a question that asks what a number of others are asking, and this is definitely a theme that has come up repeatedly. Scott asks, I'm not overly literate in history or political theory. Could you discuss what the basics of what a successful communist society would look like when capitalism has been left to history like feudalism? And now, again, as Nick considers that, just as Nick had raised the question of marrying books, um, we have, as Nick had noted, um, marrying dot com uh, in which we have a major uh, series of works by Lenin, by Trotsky, by Marxist writers as well as contemporary works and now is really the time uh, to build your Marxist library. Um, you're stuck at home, you have to uh, concern yourself with indoor activities, now is a good time to build your library and build your knowledge in Marxism. Um, so go to marrying.com and if you are in Australia, as we say in the slide that's uh, shown at the moment, you can make your orders to mering at aussiemail.com.au. In particular, I would reinforce uh, Nick's encouragement to, for you to order Revolution Betrayed by Leon Trotsky, which is $34.95, uh, which Nick mentioned in his speech. But in addition, why study the Russian Revolution, which is displayed on the screen? Nine critical lectures lectures on the history and political issues contained within the Russian Revolution, all of which we're discussing here tonight, and the Socialist Equality Party's Statement of Principles, uh, which is the fundamental principled political identity of the SEP and the basis for membership in the party. And if you are interested in joining, 
uh, or being more involved in the SCP, fill, please fill out the form uh, for, to get involved. Uh, so Nick, if you can take that question on socialism. Yeah, well, I think I would start uh, with the passage that is it contained in Marx's Communist Manifesto. He said the future society will be, in the future society, the free development of each will be the conditions for the free development of all. The first point is the following. The overthrow of capitalism means the ending of class society. Capitalism is, of course, not the first of class society. Before it, we had slavery, Rome, Greece. We had feudalism, a feudal ruling class, and we had now the, out of that the emergence of the bourgeoisie. But it's the last form of class society because the working class has no ownership in the means of property. All, the, all class society is based on different forms of property ownership of the means of production. The working class has no ownership. Its task and its role derived not from the thinking of this or that worker, but from its fundamental nature as a social class created by capitalism is to end class society and to begin the development of a society in which, as Trotsky once put it, social based upon the democratization of all social relations. This society we live in under capitalism, we're told, is a democracy. As Marx once characterized it, you know, you get to choose which member of the ruling class is going to rule over you for the next three years in elections. Genuine democracy means the involvement of everyone in economic and social life. You can go and vote in elections, but the day after you vote, a downturn in the financial markets or in the company work you work for means you're out of a job and possibly destitute. You didn't vote for that. You have no control over that. Vast economic forces operate as if they are the weather, but they're not. They're created by the collective labor of human beings, workers around the world, but they're in private hands. And so the very forces that people have created, the working class has created, and everything that's arisen on them dominates over human life and determines whether you're going to live, whether you're going to die, whether you have a job or whether you don't. You have no say in it under capitalism whatsoever. The market rules. That is, the interests of the financial oligarchies, the owners of the means of production, rule over your life. Now, that's not democracy. So socialism is, above all, based upon the democratization of social relations. Now, what will the outline of that society look like? And here we come to a fundamental point. That's not to be derived from the head of Karl Marx or Nick Beams or David North or anyone else. It'll emerge out of the historical struggle itself. The organization of society, the necessity for the development of planning will develop. As Marx is particularly rejected any conception of trying to construct the future society out of out of uh, out of his own head no he said we have to study what is actually going on and we can see within capitalist society the the outlines of what a future society socialist society could look like first it will have to be international in scope now, that's not a prescription for me. That's an economic reality. Every process of production today is carried out on a global scale. Second, it will have to be planned. 
the mechanisms for that planning already exist. They already exist in the very transnational corporations that dominate the world every day. They plan production within their own enterprise down to the last detail. If you went into a global corporation and said, oh, we're not planning, we're just going to let everything within that corporation develop according to the market, well, you wouldn't have a job for long. The problem is, yes, there's planning within these corporations, there's anarchy outside, no control. So we can see that the planning would have to be uh, organized on an international scale and developed. And it would have to be organized centrally. Again, one of the most important aspects of this crisis is that all the doctrines of the free market, you know, the, back in the 1980s, uh, Ronald Reagan, who was one of the architects of this process, said, you know, the most uh, fearsome words ever uttered, uh, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Well, hasn't that been overturned? What do we see? We see state control or state incorporation into the financial system. We see state backing of giant corporations. Statization is now a reality of life. It is necessary to organize society centrally through planning. But of course, that can't be carried out under capitalism. And what is the nature of this state? State organization is necessary, but who's going to be running that state? If it's run by the bourgeoisie and its representatives, we know the outcome. Chaos, ever deepening attacks on the working class. No, a new state has to be created. Its necessity is already demonstrated in this crisis, but it must be controlled, built by the working class. Lenin once said in, um, I think it was 1915, in analyzing the processes that were taking place in his day, the emergence of giant international corporations, centralization of ac economic activity, he said a very perceptive, made a very perceptive comment. He said, socialism is gazing at us out of all the windows of capitalist society. It's the same today. The necessity for state planning, state control, state organization is necessary. It's an economic necessity. You can't run this society according to the anarchy of the market. That's proved to be utterly bankrupt. The issue is what state will it be? How will it organize? And those conditions, how it is developed, will emerge out of the struggle itself. And there'll be all kinds of new developments that you and I haven't even thought of. Just as in 1905, the emergence of Soviets, workers' councils in Russia was something that nobody had anticipated, but they became necessary and they actually became the basis for a new state. And we're seeing the emergence of that today as workers increasingly begin to organize their own activity, develop new organizations. These organizations will become, as they develop in the struggle, the basis for a new state, a worker's state, which organizes society. And we'll have a very lively discussion, I'm sure, about how that society should be organized. You and I, if I could address the questioner, uh, may disagree on certain issues. How should society be organized? There'll be all kinds of different opinions, but those issues will be decided democratically, not by what affects the bottom line, not by what profit interests are disturbed by the decision. In planning a society, will mistakes be made? Yes, there will. We're not human beings if we don't make mistakes, but those mistakes will be corrected, analyzed, discussed, bring forth, brought, and, and a higher development brought forward.
can we organize such a society in the midst of the vast techno technological, economic developments that have been made in the past period? Anyone who denies this is simply blind to the reality. We have an enormous capacity for organizing society on an international scale. That's the perspective of socialism and the conditions for it are emerging. As Marx once said, no great historical problem ever arises without at the same time the material conditions for its resolution either being present or in the process of formation. That's the situation today. A great historical problem has arisen, but the material conditions for its resolution have very definitely arisen at the same time. We have time for one final question, which actually does bring us directly into the present day situation and the perspective of the Socialist Equality Party. Um, a questioner asks, many liberal commentators are starting to talk about a pre-COVID and a post-COVID world. Liberals cannot even begin to fathom what life might look like after COVID. We are living through a time of severe social and political restrictions on civil life and the slowing down of economic activity throughout the world, including in OECD countries like Australia. Some of these measures are not in fact commensurate to defeating a severe virus, but rather geared towards preventing social and political dissent and organization. What do you predict a post-COVID world might look like and what would this mean for a revolutionary socialist party like the SEP? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And of course, the fundamental issue is that contrary to all the nonsense put forward by different sections of the bourgeoisie, uh, this is not a crisis that's going to pass and then we all go back to what it was. I mean, everything has changed. And you can see that from past history. Let's take, as I explained uh, at the outset, World War I, a massive breakdown of capitalist society. The war concluded, but society did not go back to what had existed previously. Rather, as I outlined, new horrors developed. We see the same situation today. The, there is no turning back. Numbers of some more perceptive commentators have pointed out that of course after a recession, you know, there isn't a going back to normal. Let's take the crisis of 2008, the meltdown of the financial system. The US Fed rushed in to bail out, and the government, to bail out the banks and to bail out the corporations. The Fed introduced a policy of what it called quantitative easing. That is the buying up of treasury bonds and assets, other financial assets by the central bank. It said this would be a temporary measure. Temporary measure. Once the crisis was over, we would get back to normal didn't happen. The massive support provided by the Fed actually became a new basis for the financial system. And indeed, every time on a couple of occasions when the Fed did try to, uh, to give it its due to return to normal policies and slightly increase interest rates during 2018, but nowhere near the levels they had reached before its base rate, to return monetary policy to normal, the markets tanked at the end of 2018 when four interest rate rises had been brought in. Uh, they experienced their worst month for December since 1931 and the depths of depression. Now we have an even deeper crisis than 2008, a meltdown of the whole of society. There's not going to be a return to the past. As I pointed out, the massive amount of 
fictitious capital, paper money that's been pumped into the financial system has no intrinsic value. All of these resources are a claim on value. What's the source of value? The labor of the working class. How then is value put back in to these financial assets? Only by intensification of the exploitation of the working class, the source of value. What does that mean? Massive social struggles. Because the working class, having gone through this experience, having gone through the earlier experience of 2008, is not going to tolerate that. It's going to fight. The fights have already started. In the strikes we see developing in the United States, we've seen in Italy and elsewhere. How is the bourgeoisie going to meet that? By developing and utilizing the methods of the authoritarian, you know, the state, which they are already developing and sharpening in this crisis. There's no return to the status quo ante. The bourgeoisie will drive ever deeper its attacks on the working class. The divisions, what we see, the national divisions between the major capitalist powers will intensify. Look, in 2009, we had a conference in London, you know, chaired by Gordon Brown of the G20. It was, you know, kumbaya, we're all gathering to get together. No conferences today. No organized response today. The differences between the bourgeoisie are deepening and intensifying, and at a certain point, they will erupt in world war. We have also, of course, not so much in the background, but here in Australia, we've experienced it coming very much into the foreground, the issues of climate change. All the same questions arise. An existential threat to society. The bourgeoisie policy can only be deepening attacks on the working class, war, and the descent into barbarism. So we, what we see, what must be done out of this crisis, however it unfolds and develops, is that workers, young people, youth, students, must now join this party. It's a life and death question to build the necessary revolutionary leadership for the struggles, even bigger struggles of the working class that are going to erupt out of this crisis. I would just like to reiterate that we want to continue this discussion with you and clearly there is a lot that still is to be discussed, is to be worked through and answered. And in a minute, I'll just outline some of the upcoming meetings and discussions that we will be holding. Um, however, if you agree with the program and the perspective that we have articulated here tonight, and you want to fight for a world based on equality, on genuine democracy, and the development of mankind to its fullest heights, fullest heights that is, for a socialist world, uh, then contact us tonight. Uh, we will, as Nick said, educate you and train you as Marxists. In addition, our resources are dependent fully on the support that we receive from you. So please make as generous a donation as you can. And again, thank you to all those who have made donations already. You will be able to listen to tonight's lecture uh, on our Facebook pages. And I've just put uh, the links for those in the chat field, that's facebook.com slash IYSSC Australia and facebook.com slash Socialist Equality Party Australia. Uh, next week on Tuesday at 2 p.m., we will be fielding the third lecture, um, which will be on the politics of the socialist alternative and the pseudo left, uh, followed by the fourth lecture, socialism versus identity politics and postmodernism. We encourage you to promote these lectures and these events as widely as possible uh, through, through Facebook um, and among your friends. Uh, in addition, in the coming week, the IYSSE will be holding 
and a series of club meetings throughout the country on the issues raised in tonight's lecture on the Russian Revolution and the analysis of the coronavirus. And if you aren't a regular reader of the World Socialist website, we strongly encourage you to do so. Sorry, I think I said 2 p.m. for the lecture on Tuesday. No, it is, of course, 7 p.m., 7 p.m. Sydney time, that is. Um, so that is the next lecture and, and each lecture in this series, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Sydney time. Uh, the, uh, those will be the meetings on Tuesday evening, but we also continuing to have our please, club. Please meet. note for international supporters, there will be a daylight saving time change at April, so we need to take that into account. Yes, we encourage you to use the time zone converter that we link to in our email. So if you aren't getting our emails, um, please fill out the Get Involved form so that you can be notified uh, with all the relevant details. Um, the other e meetings that we will be uh, holding over the next week, as I said, the clubs are still active, politically active on the campuses. Uh, we will have a meeting at Griffith University on Thursday at 1.30, at Melbourne University Friday at 1 o'clock, University of Newcastle will be Friday at 1.30, and a combined Sydney area meeting of Macquarie University, WSU and UNSW, which will be on Monday at 1 p.m. And to take part in those, again, you can just use those links that are in the chat field um, or sign up uh, as a contact to receive regular meetings, uh, invitations and notices. I'd just like to reiterate, uh, Nick, as uh, thanks for your attendance. Uh, thank you for your questions and thank you as well to Nick uh, for both giving this lecture and fielding your questions.